Welcome to JS Podcast number 114. I'm Stephen Knight. How the hell are you? Very pleased to bring you a conversation I had with Alistair Lichton. Alistair is the Education Campaigns Officer for the National Secular Society. And we had a really interesting discussion about faith schools, um, how that works in the UK, how that differs from other systems, what the main areas of concerns are, specifically evangelism in schools, and, and what parents can do to help push back against some of that, which tends to happen under the radar, goes unnoticed a lot of the time. As a matter of fact, if it, if it were not for organisations like the National Secular Society, I probably wouldn't hear about a lot of these concerning faith-based transgressions on our educational system. So uh, Alice is going to talk us through that. We also talk about the Secularist of the Year Awards, which is taking place on March 24th, which is a Saturday. I'll be there. There are um, a number of people that have been nominated. Some of them I'm familiar with, others I'm not. So I'm really excited to learn about what they've been up to and hear about their work. You can still get tickets, so if you're interested in that, head over to secularism.org.uk forward slash events. Whilst you're there, take a look at some of the campaigns that the National Secular Society are working on. See if that's the kind of thing you think deserves some support. And if it is, consider becoming a member. If you can't become a member right now, just share some of their campaigns around. Get a few more eyes on them. It's always it's always helpful and I'm sure they'll appreciate it. You can find Alistair on Twitter at Alistair. Lichton, that's A-L-A-S-T-A-I-R-L-I-C-H-T-E-N. I'll, I'll, put, it, I'll put it in the show notes. You'll find it there. Um, send him some follow-up questions. I'm, I'm sure I'll be happy to hear from you. You can keep up to date on the podcast at gspellchecker.com. Enjoy. Very pleased to welcome Alistair Lichton to the GS podcast. Alistair, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks, Stephen. Excellent, good to speak to you again. We'd, we only saw each other uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Darwin lecture, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah, that was good. Uh, speak, uh, getting to get out and about and meet people. Uh, I, I really think in this age of online social media activism, which can be you know very loud and shouty, there is. Uh, just a huge value in just meeting people face to face, and you know, even when people very much, very much disagree with you, I find it, conversations which just make which just make us think and try and you know empathise with and understand each other better are always worth it. Yeah, it's, it, I I have a much more enjoyable experience when I go to events and and speak to people face to face rather than uh, rather than the typical Twitter interac- interactions. But um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, there was some young schoolgirls there who who had brought some um, artwork of Darwin's finches, and they had a little stall set up. And I went over to speak to them, and it was just really nice to hear a bunch of young schoolchildren really passionate about evolution and actually knowing quite a lot about it, which is surprised. I think once you were uh, once you were at a certain age, you kind of uh, sort of get a little bit more dismissive of school kids and their knowledge. But these people were really well educated on it so i mean kind of bodes well for the future doesn't it yeah i mean i was at an event just a week before the darwin awards which is called politicon and it's organized by these six form uh, political students uh, politics a level students uh, and i've been there for a couple of years in a row and i'm just incredibly impressed with the, you know the questioning i had this long good like you know, really, dis- really disagreeing, uh, 10, 15 minute debate with these couple of uh, seventeen-year-olds, who were you know completely in favour of faith schools. Uh, you know, I-, I tried to <laughs> bring around was there anything we were going to agree agree on that no, they're, they're fine with discrimination in teachers, uh, staff, 
fine with uh, you know re being taught from a biased perspective and you know that's you know a really a big disagreement but just no animosity no you know uh, no meanness in that and actually what i got the sense more than them necessarily being massively in favor of faith schools is that they just sort of it saw it as a natural thing that they hadn't thought about yeah it's, it's interesting like if you if you go in there with the um the intent to let people know something they might not know rather than just wanting to win a battle i think you can you can change minds that way something i've um tried to progress over the years i don't always succeed but it's definitely more um more worthwhile i think uh definitely more valuable to engage with people that way but we've um Jumped ahead a little bit here. So, Alistair, maybe you can tell me a little bit about the National Secular Society and what are some of the, the general principles that you uh, stand for? Uh, so the National Secular Society uh, founded in 1866 and our principles are about challenging religious privilege and promote in order to promote freedom and fairness. We very strongly believe that Secularism shouldn't be seen as a threat to religious freedom, but in fact, the best guarantor of religious freedom. Um, Secularism isn't challenging people's personal beliefs. It's about saying that those personal beliefs shouldn't lead to you being privileged or discriminated against, and it shouldn't they shouldn't be used by you to impose your will on others. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point to make because I think there is. Um... There's a lot of misunderstanding around the word secularism. Some of it, I think, possibly willful. People will try and represent it as some anti-religious force looking to wipe away anything slightly faith-based from the public sphere, which is just not true at all. And I've noticed in in recent years with the NSS, there's been a very specific focus on bringing religious people into the fold uh, and having a wider uh, conversation. And what you tend to find is that most religious people, moderate religious people, are fully in favor of secular principles anyway once you get talking about it yeah uh, obviously uh, secularism ha- is a word that ha- has been you know, a real effort to denigrate and to represent it as this sort of you know controlling uh, anti-religious thing um and it, and it, it's true like if if your form of religion needs to be privileged and needs to force itself onto other people to survive then yes secularism is a threat to your religion but if your religion doesn't want that if you're if you want to just live your life you know and live your faith and not impose it on others then secularism is you know it's, it's your best friend and we often do see that it is reli- religious people they may have more of an ex- more of an experience of religious authority being imposed on them and therefore might be more likely to more likely to support secularism what is your official title at the national secular society what would you describe uh, the bulk of what takes up your time there so i've recently been made the education and schools officer uh, i've been at the national secular society four years now and i've worked in a whole variety of campaigning roles but i think uh, part of the reason of making me specifically education and schools is because that is the biggest area of our work. Uh, the education system is, you know, the area of public life where a lack of secularism and where religious privilege really most impacts most people. Uh, and it's an area that I've been developing and incre- increasing expertise in. And uh, the National Secular Society really wanted uh, to demonstrate how seriously we take this issue, this whole this whole area. So. Maybe, I mean, our schooling system's a little bit different uh, than the wider um, world, I suppose. I suppose the Americans might not recognise some of the things we talk about, but maybe you could just let us know in what way um, our schooling system, specifically faith schools, transgresses on, on the principles of secularism to the point where you have to uh, dedicate your time to campaigning against these things. Okay, so I'm going to use a term, uh, faith schools, uh, but I want to be clear first of all that that's uh, not a legal term it is a descriptive term uh we there's no need for us to get into you know the minutiae the differences between different types of faith schools so you know we've got things called voluntary aided voluntary controlled faith ethos faith designated academies all those sorts of things so what i'm just what, when i say things a faith school i mean that it, a religious organization has a formal role in the governance of the school uh, and uh, within that, I think it's probably 
important for uh, listeners to understand is there is a range. Uh, when we talk about faith schools, there are, uh, you know, one end of the scale, you may have, you know, really extreme faith schools where you've got 100% religious discrimination in admissions, 100% religious discrimination in staff, you know, and religion, you know, uh, religious ethos being heavily promoted in every lesson. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got, you might have a faith school that's a Church of England faith school that's, you know, called a faith school, uh, but uh, they don't actually have any discrimination in admissions. Uh, they might have you know, a few uh, church, uh, church governors involved in the governing of the school. Uh, and But, you know, it's pretty light touch. Um, RE is taught according to the locally agreed syllabus rather than according to a confessional syllabus. So there is a, there is a real range. And even beyond that range, uh, I don't work specifically on faith schools. I work on the problem of inappropriate religious influence, religious privilege in our education system. Uh, I've heard of community schools, which uh, might, we might colloquially call secular schools. So a community school, there's no religious involvement in the governance, no religious discrimination. I've heard of community schools where there are prayer, prayers four times a day. Huh. Um, and I, I say I've heard of school. That's not one example. That's multiple examples. Four times um, a day. I mean, is the do they get the answer machine on the first prayer and then they have to <laughs> follow up prayers later in the day? That, that's absurd, isn't it? Is that and that's is this like a Christian school for prayers a day? Those examples are from community schools. So those are schools when there is no formal religious role in the governance of the school, uh, but uh, you can often have in a situation where you've got a teacher who's you know wants oh, okay. to use their position to really push it. Um, we can get on it's a bit to talk about compulsory worship or yes. collective worship as the as a, as it's legally called in England and Wales and that's a legal requirement for every school in England and Wales to have a daily act of predominantly Christian collective worship uh, if if any of our any of listeners at home thinking I don't remember that at all uh, they're pro- it's probably because a lot of schools just ignore this requirement mm. Or they, you know, they call something collective worship for, you know, to tick a box, but really it's just, you know, you know like assembly, a moral usually, assembly. Isn't it? Think, yeah. yeah. Uh, but as long as that law is in place, it, there, there is the ability for, um, there is there is the ability for if you've got a head teacher who really wants to push, collect, you know, push collective worship, to really take advantage of that. Um, a lot of, uh, in in a lot of the areas we work on, and I, I might talk in a bit about uh, evangelism in schools, that is like external groups going into non-religious schools, you know, in order to evangelize. Um, it's you've got the structures, you've got you know the rules that are written down, but as in as in uh, in life, most things really do come down to the people involved. And if you've got a teacher in a school or a, uh, some governors in a school who feel it's appropriate to push religion then there's not really anything prescriptive to stop that happening. Right, I mean, that, that's concerning, isn't it? So if if I'm part of some um, overtly evangelical Christian sect and I want to spread my message to the young, impressionable, malleable minds in, in UK schools, how, how do I get in there? What's the process by which I can end up in that uh, assembly uh, sort of playing my wares? So uh, uh, I'll probably start by uh, talking about an area of our work then that we call uh, evangelism in schools. Uh, A few years ago, we noticed there were were getting increased uh, examples of this, you know, getting calls, emails from parents saying, um, you know, this this assembly is coming in, this open the book or this scripture union, they're coming in and uh, doing classes. And I found out they've been there for six weeks and they, you know, they are just proselytizing, they're evangelizing. So we started looking at these groups, and it is, you know, it's quite a quite a big, big sector. Now, I, I, I will say that I think external groups going into schools, including religious groups, can have, you know, a really uh, good beneficial uh, beneficial educational uh, value. You know, having having a speaker come into assembly to tell you about, you know, I'm of this religion. This is what we believe. You know, this is how we practice things like that. That's that's education. There's a difference between that and evangelism. Uh, often, uh, because of the collective worship requirement we were talking about earlier, these groups can sell themselves to schools by saying, "Look, you know, you've got uh, you legally have to do collective worship, and we can come in and just you know do that for you. That ticks the box." Uh, schools are often, you know, quite naive about this. They, um, 
they see you know, the external group that might be you know, a very good external group offering to come and do an assembly about uh, you know, drugs awareness or uh, anti-bullying. And that, you know, that can be really beneficial, but they often just don't have that um, the knowledge of you know, who, exactly who these groups are, intelligence not being shared. They often don't know how to set appropriate boundaries. Uh, so, for example, the promotion of partisan political views, you can't, you can't promote partisan political views in schools. So that means when you, you know, you might have your uh, school assembly, you might have their local MP come in and give a talk about politics. The school, because of that, would feel quite empowered to set, you know, sort of boundaries about, you know, OK, so you're going to say your views, but you're not here to, you know, politically campaign unless it's part of the balanced thing. Uh, schools often they just they, they may lack uh, te- individual teachers just may lack the expertise or the experience just to sort of say okay you know, uh, you know these are the boundaries you're going to come in you're going to talk about this but you can't you know just, just can't be presenting this as if it is fact and you know it is a, a huge a huge area a huge industry a huge industry almost um, so monitor you know and having just the National Secular Society trying to monitor that is uh, quite difficult. Um, you know, kids aren't always the best at telling their parents stuff. So often we have, you know, an email from a parent saying, "Oh, you know, this this uh, group was coming into my into uh, my kid's school and uh, scaring them about hell, and uh, you know, this preacher's coming in and burning one paper cup in front of the class of uh, primary school teacher, primary school students, saying, you know, this is the um, this is you if you're unbaptized and burning in hell, and then." dipping another paper cup in water and lighting it on fire and saying, no, this is why you need to be baptized. And you, and you think, oh, God, that's terrible. When, when did this? And, oh, it's been, this is the third assembly they've done this term. Um, so sc- schools don't, e- e- uh, often don't even have policies require, you know, requiring them to inform uh, parents of external visitors. So, I mean, do you, do you tend to raise these concerns with the schools in question directly? And, and, and if so, what sort of responses do you usually get? Well, we always uh, would rather the parents raise it with the school. Sure. So uh, we've we've raised it with the Department of Education over many years. You know, trying to get their, them to endorse a code of practice. I think there are some voluntary code of, codes of practice out there for religious visitors to schools. I, I'm, I might be wrong, but I think the RE Council may have produced. Uh, no, the uh, National Association of RE Teachers has, I think, has produced some voluntary guidance on that. Uh, so we you know we've we've tried to get the DfE to you know to you know, set out some pretty some clearer rules, give schools some more support. But if you've got an issue with a school, I think it, you really need to get the parents to speak the parents to speak to the school, the parents to challenge it. We always say, um, you know, let's try try and have a productive conversation with the school. Um, we normally think when a group's coming in like this, um, that it's more likely to be, a case of a teacher, you know, just being a bit naive or not having thought things through or considered th- considered things more. That's more likely than necessarily it them being there trying, you know, supporting this evangelism. Um, schools often often you, you may not be able to stop this it, this uh, visit happening, but you can say to the school, look, okay, you know, this is going to happen. They're going to come in next week, but maybe maybe do a bit more research next time. Maybe not invite them back. Um, Maybe ensure that there's always a teacher in the room, and the teacher, you know, has is briefed on how to ensure that appropriate boundaries are maintained. Uh, just saying, one uh, of the highest profile evangelism in school schemes that we have been, you know, somewhat successful in challenging is Operation Christmas Child. I know you did a video on that uh, a few mean, years ago. You mean my YouTube masterpiece? It'll be henceforth referred to, please, Alistair. Okay, so as you as you as you said in your YouTube masterpiece, <laughs> did I get that right? Spot on. Thank you. Checks in the post. So, as a Samaritan's Purse operations Operation Christmas Child uh, shoe, shoebox scheme, that's an ev- evangelism in schools in, in schools um, scheme that is quite well known, and we've been successful in persuading schools not uh, not to take part in the scheme. I mean, most likely now. Uh, you, you can see, uh, you can see why it seems like this appeal to to schools. You know, this sounds like a, just a nice thing, and you know, probably quite educational. Uh, but luckily, you know, if we can keep pushing the message that you know, uh, exposing some of the things that groups like this do, then hopefully the school goes on the internet, they search it, and one of the things that come up is your YouTube masterpiece <laughs> or our own or 
you know it's it's funny because I put out I put out a lot of content over the years and I expect a, a certain amount of abuse and backlash depending on what I put out but I think that's the thing that brings me daily insults still that video the YouTube comments because I there's just a lot of people very unhappy that I'm intent on stealing Christmas joy from children so we should we should probably explain this is um a charitable initiative whereby children fill um, shoeboxes with toys, wrap them up and, and send them off to less privileged countries so that them children have something to open on Christmas Day. What many parents don't hear about is the fact that the the organisation organization behind this, the Samaritan's Purse, often bundle it with uh, you know various religious propaganda booklets and things like that. And um, almost, I think, they, they invite the children to, uh, to a sort of sermon before they're able to open the presents and things like that. It's quite it's quite sinister when you uh, consider, I think it's, um, is it Bill, not Billy Graham, is it Billy Graham that's behind it? I think it's, uh, was he the, our recently dearly departed? Um, he's, what's his I son called? His, yeah, Franklin Graham. Franklin Graham, it's Franklin Graham, yeah. Uh, he's behind it, he's got some very nefarious, you know, just like, you know, like father like son, some very nefarious views on homosexuality and other things. So, yeah, it's funny because when, because I, I noticed you guys have done a lot of work on this and I've been spreading that around and after making my video, I've been hearing from a lot of parents who have, who has said, look, we uh, we noticed our school was doing this. We forwarded them the information that, um, you know, the NSS and you've been putting out and they've actually retracted the scheme. They've actually decided it's not a good idea for the school to do it anymore. So I think this is, I think it's a really, like you say, about encouraging the parents to approach the school about this, these issues. I think that's definitely the best approach, isn't it? Yeah, and as we as we, we say with, you know, all of the issues that we encourage uh, parents to speak to schools about is I think it's important to focus on you know the principles of fair of you know fairness and equality that are at stake. Almost every school you know has a statement of values which are about inclusion, equality, and fairness. So you know sort of say that in supporting things like this are not in line with the values of your school. Um, if if you uh, uh, if you're trying to challenge uh, Samaritans first by uh, Operation Christmas Child or any other evangelising in the school scheme by you know here's my top 10 scientific proofs why god doesn't exist it's <laughs> that's not it's not helpful and it's it's not it's not it's not really relevant uh, these should be issues on which people of all faiths and none can agree uh, there are plenty there are plenty of uh, christians who have written in, in criticizing samaritan's birth there you know there are christians who 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 talk about compelled worship in school as you know that being just completely antithetical to their values as well um and the point you raised about you know, the sort of the backlash you've got over your YouTube uh, video masterpiece, <laughs> it's funny because we've never written a story. We don't think we've ever mentioned Samaritan's Birth without there always being, and here are some, you know, here's how you can find better, more ethical, more educational, more effective charitable, charitable giving alternatives. Um, I want to just uh, talk briefly about uh, a, a, a primary school in Kent uh, in October. If we're talking about evangelism in schools, this was uh, Saint James, Saint John's Church, of England Primary School in Tunbridge Wells. Uh, that was where uh, parents complained about the content of sessions uh, by an evangelical organisation called Cross Teach, uh, which was upsetting upsetting their students. So this was when parents at the school complained about the uh, content of sessions. This is assemblies and I think possibly classes as well being led by an evangelical organisation called Cross Teach. And uh, now parents, this was just leaving um, their, their children really traumatised. You know, often, particularly when Church of England schools, people, children go to these schools because uh you know often they're the nearest school it's it, 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 these aren't religious communities these schools um so, so one parent one, uh, one parent said children were told that if they did not believe in god they would, go, they would not go to a good place when they died uh, and parents started you know uh, speaking to each other and saying yeah, yeah we're hearing this from our children as well and they started withdrawing their children from assemblies and then the number of people of uh, parents withdrawing them from assemblies made made these things just completely um, unsustainable, and this was in a, this uh, organisation becoming in delivering assemblies and lessons at school for sixteen years, and that and, and sort of the school were there, you know, you know, very angry, annoyed, and accused these these uh, parents of extremism for trying to you know 
had their kids go to school without being just proselytized to. So another, another, and I think an important thing in that is, is, is to speak to other, speak to other parents and to not just, you know, not be fobbed off with, you know, oh, why are you complaining? They've been coming, you know, coming here telling, telling children that are going to go to hell for 16 years in assemblies, you know, who are you to complain? <laughs> Well, um, there's, there's a, tr a, a tricky thing around this now that I'm seeing it gain more momentum and I'm, I'm hearing it more places. And it, it often comes from sort of atheists who profess secularism, but they're more on the, the conservative end of the spectrum. And they will say that this erosion of, of Christianity from our national fabric, I suppose, is, is a bad idea in the face of Islam. I mean, I, I agree that... Um, removing religion and, and combating faith schools uh, uh, certainly religious indoctrination should I say is a, a positive and a good thing to be doing but there's this this secondary question of now now about well what fills that void and uh, a lot of people who are not Christian but still have some you know uh, some sort of residual love for it I'll, I'll, I'll often champion Christianity and say I'm not Christian myself I'm an atheist but it's still the best foundation for our children in terms of uh, this I suppose they, they see it as some sort of opposition to the increase in Islam yeah I, I just uh, remember, they've got what one particular follower on Twitter and every time we do a news story about education and uh, being that Christian schools outnumber any other religious school uh, uh, category of religious school in the country they are a large number of the news stories we do and so we do a news story about uh, compulsory worship and there and they will get the tweet well at least it's not compulsory islamic worship <laughs> what about the and, madrasas yeah and and we do a story about you know parents left with no choice but to send their kids to a faith school well at least it's not a uh, muslim faith school yeah um this idea that privileging christianity will protect us from other religions being privileged. I, I think it, it fails in just both practical and moral terms. Yeah. Uh, we, we see, uh, I'm reading a book at the moment called Competing Fundamentalisms, and we see around the world that when one religion is privileged and it is given special, special treatment, that doesn't discourage others from wanting to be treated specially. Uh, when you have blasphemy laws in Europe designed to protect Christianity from criticism, that does that does, that then leads to Islamic groups saying, "Well, we want the same laws to protect us." Yeah, it's often it often comes in you know quite a self-serving way. I remember when a lot of the issues were coming out around um, the Trojan horse uh, incident in in uh, Birmingham schools, and the Archbishop of Canterbury is like, well, this just shows that we need more church schools. <laughs> um, so, yeah, more, uh, more petrol for the fire. Yeah. The, the idea of, if we all embraced, you know, everyone in Britain embraced a Christian identity and we all treated Christianity especially, that that would uh, defend against Islam, it just, uh, to me, it doesn't seem at all practical because I mean, you can't get people to embrace christianity uh, you, uh how 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 large you, you, you however hard it seems you try you can't get it we're now a majority non-religious country uh and it's it's not moral it's i just find it um very very problematic and then when you you ask people about you know oh what christian values is it you want and they they, are, they tend to give you sort of statements of things which are quote unquote Christian values, which are not in any way uniquely Christian. Yeah. Uh, so uh, having a national framework of values that we, which we can support, I think that's a good idea. That and we have that. We have through equality law and human rights, you know, broad principles that people from all different backgrounds can support. Um, there is. Um, we might come, come come around back to talking about it. Um, the, the the idea that you know the erosion of the erosion of Christian privilege by uh, by you know political correctness or secularism or you know equality and human rights is le is leaving a moral vacuum, and I don't think that really stands up. Uh, we need you know we need these principles of fairness, equality. You know some people might want to call those Christian principles. Um, as I say, you know, some people might be motivated by what they call Christian principles to be deeply opposed to faith schools, to be deeply opposed to religious discrimination. So uh, education is the largest area of our work. And although it's a little bit more complicated than uh, faith schools versus non-faith schools, it is one of the biggest area 
that draws people to National Secular Society. People who are in favour of faith schools, they often want to portray this as being about religious versus non-religious. But if you start looking at the issues around faith schools, you can see there is a potential for uh, for very broad agreement across people uh, across people of all faiths and none. Uh, if you look at, um, I know there's some some polling was done last year by the uh, uh, by the Accord Coalition. This was around government plans to increase religious discrimination in faith schools, and you know there was just big, big majorities in every religion and belief group against faith-based discrimination in school admissions. Uh, there will be differences of opinion. You know, some people say, um, uh, oh yeah, I'm against, I'm against faith schools, but if we had them, then yeah, they probably should be able to discriminate and you know teach RE in a confessional way. And other people uh, say, I'm, I'm in favour of faith schools, but I don't think they should discriminate. It's, there's, there's, there's a whole range of opinions. Let's just look at the sort of education system we want. And I think most people want an inclusive education system. They want a, a education system that is free from discrimination. They want schools where uh, young people learn about different worldviews. They learn about uh, they might learn about religion, but not be taught how to be religious. Uh, we had a first uh, protest, uh, just, you know, just a, a small one outside Parliament uh, last week that was focused on uh, the government's proposed policy to increase the proportion of religious discrimination in school admissions. Uh, this is known as the 50% cap. Uh, we can come on to talk about how that works and, um, works if you'd like. But basically, the, the short, short thing is the government wants to increase the number of schools that can apply 100% discrimination in admissions. So we had a little protest about that. We've called on um, the new education secretary, Damien Hines, who is a supporter of increasing the discrimination, uh, not to. Um, and we have called on the education select committee to hold an inquiry um, because of uh, how exactly this whole policy area works is there won't actually need, there doesn't need to be any laws passed or any votes in parliament to uh, to bring in this new policy. So. We're hoping that the set committee will at least have an inquiry on it. Okay, so I mean, I suppose there's um, a lot of people that will just argue in favour of faith schools because they'll say, well, education's about getting children through the uh, schooling system with the best grades and, and therefore the best possible chance at further education or employment. And uh, they'll often point to the, the actual grade averages from faith schools and they're, they're not too shabby to say the least. So how do you usually draw a, stink, a distinction there between uh, achieving grades and uh, being against faith schools per se? Um, well, that's not... I mean, that really are experience of, of the main of the of the main arguments. One of the things we we did, we stood down and thought, you know, we're all in the we all are against faith schools, but let's actually really listen to why people who either are very supportive of faith schools or maybe just haven't thought about it much, what reasons do they do they give for being in, in favour of it? And this idea about grades is definitely one the government give. I think it's you know one that you occasionally hear. You know, if you're talking to people out and about about faith schools. Uh, this, the uh, short answer is that the evidence on, you know, uh, on, on faith schools performing e uh, disproportionately better isn't that strong. What evidence there is can largely be explained by a degree of social, social economic selection. Whenever you have any form of discrimination uh, in school admissions, uh, more more economically advantaged people, i.e., middle class, pushy elbow parents, are going to be better at ga uh, be better at gaming the system. So, because faith schools can discriminate in terms of religion, that leads to a uh, effective selection in selection in terms of you know more likely to be middle class parents in the school. So, and that you know we know that that explains a lot of the different performances of schools. And even you know that's that explains a lot. But and actually. The supposed, um, you know, better exams. It's not the evidence isn't hugely clear anyway to start with. Okay, we'll we'll chalk that one down to uh, unverified claim, I think. And and also, I mean, let's say segregating children by race produced uh, schools, some schools performing uh, ten percent better. We we wouldn't do it. No? I mean, if we. Uh, you know, segregate, segregated not by religious worldview but by political worldview. And we had, you know, Marxist schools and neoliberal schools and you know, Labour and Conservative and Lib Dem schools. 
And it turns out, oh, you know, we've got a little bit better exam performance, you know, a few more grades A to C in this one. Would that be an argument? Uh, it's interesting that we, we talk about uh, segregating by race because one of the problems that um, is caused by faith schools, particularly minority faith schools, is an ethnic segregation. Uh, minority faith academies, so this is Sikh schools, Hindu schools, Muslim schools, are all in the high 90%, 90% BME. And these are not in areas that are 90% BME. Uh, so the presence of these schools does have, you know, leads not only directly to, it leads directly to religious segregation, but it does have the indirect effect of social economic selection and certainly within certain types of schools, racial, racial segregation. So you, you said you've been with the NSS for, did you say four years? Yeah. And I suspect that the, at the, uh, the latter end of that service, there may have been a bigger uh, focus on either, you know, from the general public uh, to yourselves and an emphasis on, on Islam. I was just wondering, has that become, in your view, uh, more of an issue in, in terms of the uh, reports you're getting from parents and the things that are happening in the public sphere from, say, the Trojan horse, things that maybe wouldn't have been on the radar at all four years ago are now starting to take up uh, much more of your time, I would imagine. Um, yes and no. Uh, so we've been for many years raising the issue of unregistered schools and a lot of those uh, school unregistered schools are motivated by Islam or in a lot of them also Jewish, Jewish unregistered schools. Uh, so the whole issue of ex of extremism in schools and uh, trying to get this idea that young people have an independent right to have an education which is broad and balanced, have an education that's not just preparing them for life in a religious community has come into the mainstream more. So there's been more stories on that. I, I often find that people with the NSS, possibly because of the range of stuff that we work on, they find it easy to find in us what either they like or what they don't like. So uh, I think statistically we do a lot more work on uh, Christian schools, but uh, maybe if we do work on Islamic schools, that, cap that captures um, more media attention. Uh, I was uh, a couple of years ago helping a parent who was dealing with an issue of you know in of this increased religious ethos in their community school. So it's a non-religious school, and I went on the um, the website of the school and I, I'm looking up and it seemed to all be being driven by this one governor who was a local priest and you know on the website says you know I, uh, I one of my my things I want to do as a governor here is to increase the relationship with the church and I lead assemblies um, and these assemblies become, you know, increasingly focused around collective worship. And I just, you know, I thought, well, we're going to write, we're going to try and advise this parent and we'll, you know, we'll help them speak to the school and we'll do a news story on it. If it was, I, I do, you know, just deep down know that if the story was, uh, and is not, it was an, um, it was the local imam and they were trying to impose Islamic collective worship in the schools and trying to, you know, create a, a close relationship between the school and the mosque, uh, that would then get more media attention. Uh, I look at the issues around collect around evangelism in the schools and you know, these groups just going in just to you know, evangelize to to students. Um, religious privilege is different uh, for di for different groups. We tend to. Uh, it, we tend to be much more skeptical of Islam having involvement in the state than mm. we are of Christianity. But then uh, we are much more, you know, there's there's much bigger taboo against criticizing Islam than there is uh, criticizing uh, Christianity. So uh, different, and also different people are, are affected by things differently. Depending depending on your personal circumstances, one form of religious privilege might be, you know, that is just, you know, having a huge defining effect on your life. Um, uh, caste discrimination, which, you know, has, has we've, there's been decades of delayed action at outlawing uh, discrimination based on the idea of caste in this country uh, because of uh, uh, lobbying by Hindu groups. Uh, and to the people who are affected by that, you know, quite a niche issue, that's a huge issue. That is a, that can be a huge life uh, um, defi defining air, uh, form of religious privilege. If you're suffering, you know, 
from ex- uh, from the effects of Islamist extremism, if you're being targeted and bullied bullied by Islamists, then that's you know a huge that's that's the biggest thing to you. Um, the uh, maybe Christian uh, religious privilege within our education system may not always hit the same levels of highs, but the breadth of the people that are affected by it probably adds up to more. Yeah, that's just a, a consequence of numbers, isn't it? Um, in terms of looking at something slightly more positive, and it's, it's something I always look forward to every year, Secularist of the Year, and um, I always enjoy that. It's always a great event. Some always some fantastic nominees. People, uh, you know, includes people I've, I'm familiar with, and often many people I'm not. And uh, I o- I always learn something when I go. So maybe you could tell me what's the plan for this year? Yeah, um, it's an event I really look forward to, and the looking forward to it for me is obviously a, a bit of a long a longer period. We start. Um, for, I, I just let people know we have every year an event called Secularist of the Year. That's where we invite nominate we invite nominations. Uh, we draw up a shortlist and we uh, award it to an individual, an organisation, uh, you know, who's been act who's been an activist who's promoting secularism and related human rights. And we give them a you know, we have a lovely free course dinner, you know, a few drinks, nice social, give them a and give them a prize. Uh, and I just see over the months that we had the nominations open. Uh, we you we get emails about people, and it is amazing just the range of set of 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 secular actors. It's amazing the 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 range of people that you may not have heard of, I may not have heard of, but may not have a big following on Twitter or their own podcast, but are out there really challenging religious fundamentalism, really uh, challenging the intrusion of religious extremism into their lives, really standing up for human rights. One of the things I'm I'm always amazed about is how often it is people who are religious themselves who are on the forefront of challenging this fundamentalism who have experienced the problems when religious when religious fundamentalists have power and therefore are some of the strongest advocates for secularism so tickets are available for that now um and what's the date of the event again so that's saturday the 24th of march in uh central london nearest uh, station is russell square uh, tickets are fifty pounds. Uh, members get a twenty percent discount, so that's uh, forty pounds. If my amazing maths is correct. <laughs> Alistair, is there anything else you wanted to get in at all before I let you get back to your evening? Yeah, uh, I've actually got a, uh, another event in uh, in London that I'm super looking forward to. Uh, we will be back up north. We we've got uh, all, not all our events are in London. Uh, you can catch up with any upcoming events by going to secularism dot org forward slash events and i hope we'll be back up in manchester in september but i'm not sure uh the other event i want to talk about in london on the 14th of april is our 21st century re for all event and that will be talking about the future of religion and belief education in schools uh, how do we treat this subject area so that young people no matter what school they go to uh, learn about different worldviews. They learn about religion, not how to be religious. We didn't get into it in much detail, but in this country, we don't have an RE curriculum. The RE curriculum is def- is defined at local levels. Uh, in uh, in in faith schools, it's, just, it's the, the the religious education curriculum is defined by the religious organisation that runs the school. In other in community schools, it's just, it's defined by a by a committee, which is made up often you no know, uh, made up of uh, faith representatives. Uh, so in, in this event, we're going to we're going to have our keynote speaker is Professor A.C. Grayling. He's going to talk from a philosophical perspective about learning about worldviews. And then we've got a panel of experts in the RE community. And there's going to be plenty of time for these in, in, interactive roundtable discussions as well. So that's uh, Saturday, the 14th of April at Conway Hall in central London. Excellent. It's all happening then. Um, Alistair, thank you very much for speaking to me. I'm uh, a huge staunch supporter of the NSS. I really enjoy what you do and it's, uh, you kind of uh, keep an eye on all the important things, but it, you always maintain a very sensible and objective approach to it as well. So uh, I'm pleased to be a member. I'm well, pleased to have you. Thank you for listening to the Godless Spellchecker podcast. The podcast is a one-man operation, producing my spare time away from my day job, and I love making it for you. If you enjoy what you hear, please consider lending some support. 
The show is entirely listener supported. I don't sell anything, I don't run ads, and uh, given the alternative and unpopular focus of my content, it's very unlikely to find a sponsor. So there are a number of ways you can support and chip in and, and help improve the show and give me more time to produce more content. You can become a patron supporter and pledge a monetary amount per month or per episode by visiting patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker. If you can't lend monetary support right now, don't worry, there's other ways you can help the podcast too. You can share it on your various social media networks, or take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to it. Your support is massively appreciated. Thank you. Think we've all learned something here today?